Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you that we can come to you. We can look to your word. And in it, oh Lord, we find the answers. We find that which you've prepared for us in order for us to be able to walk in the life that you've promised. A life, oh, of abundance. A life of joy. A life of love and peace with our Heavenly Father, Lord. And even the world around us because of our place in Christ. Oh, Lord, we thank you for the promises. May it be that we would have ears that would hear, hearts to receive, Lord, and hands that are quick to operate in that which you promised. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the Apostle Paul, up to this point in time, has been taking us through a lesson on gifts, on ministries, and manifestations as it pertains to the power of the Holy Spirit within the Christian's life. Last week we looked specifically at how it is that we have a great body. Oh, a great body. The body of Christ. The body that is meant to work as many independent parts but to come together and to function as one and what we found out was is that there are all kinds of different body parts and if you were here last week remember we looked left and we looked right and we saw toeses and noses and all kinds of other stuff because there's a representation of different parts of the body sitting right here today we also learned that you can't separate a part of the body from the whole and remain healthy if your foot decides that it doesn't want to play with you anymore and it decides to take a hike and it leaves separated from the body the foot by itself is not going to function very long it's going to begin to die what it leaves behind is a one-footed body that now has to hop wherever it goes rather than being able to walk and function as the way that God designed it having a good understanding of the body was given to us by example that we have a body. So we know when there's a part of our body that's not functioning right, it affects the whole. Same principle for the church of Jesus Christ. And so as we move into this next section, it's interesting because we see the Apostle Paul almost seem to drift off topic. He's been talking about gifts and ministries and manifestations, and it seems like he kind of departs from that for chapter 13 to get back into the gifts in chapter 14. Well, the question is, is this, is this kind of a, a, a weary apostle drifting off topic, or was it purposed and intentional? Well, I believe that it's not an interruption of the discussion. I don't believe that Paul lost his train of thought as it pertains to talking about the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe what Paul is doing is taking an opportunity to talk about how the gifts, how the ministries, how the manifestations and power of the Holy Spirit can only, listen church, only operate in a context of love can only operate in a context of love. And so he's going to take time within the midst of talking about spiritual gifts to add the critical ingredient to them, which is love. Now, this is the character of God. And it's something that we see given to us even in the Old Testament representation. When we go back and we look at the picture of the high priest, the priest that was appointed to once a year enter into the Holy of Holies and to do so to make intercession for the people. Oh, he had this robe that he wore. It was a special robe as designed by God himself that required them to take and adorn the bottom with gold bells, solid gold bells sewn into the seam, the hem of the priest's robe. The, bill, bull, bleh, bleh. the bells were there and placed so that those that were outside the Holy of Holies, those that, that were not able to see the priest, because nobody could look at what he was doing. They couldn't see him behind the curtain. But they could listen, and by listening they would hear the bells, knowing then that their priest was alive, that he was well, and he was doing his job. And it was this incredible picture. If they wanted to know that their high priest was doing what it was that he was supposed to do, all they had to do was get quiet and listen. Now the neat thing about these bells is they weren't just sewn on in any fashion. And as a matter of fact, it's told to us that the way that they were put in place caused them to ring in such a way that it literally sounded like a patterned music. It was like a song. It wasn't just clashing. It wasn't just bells ringing like a cowbell or something. I mean, this was something that caused it to take and have this harmonious type of effect as the priest went about doing what it is that the priest was subscribed to do. Now, it's interesting because when we look at this aspect of 
the bells, the bells in biblical typology represent the gifts of God. The bells are the gifts. They're that which rings out. And the reason that it's so important that we realize that this picture of God with the bells has to do with this harmonious interaction is because that's the way the gifts, that's the way the people of God are supposed to utilize the gifts of God in harmony. In harmony. It's supposed to be a sound that is really pleasant to listen to. As God's people would use the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are given to us, as we would manifest those not only in the body of Christ, but outside to the world, it should be something that's pleasant to listen to. It should be something that people are drawn to. It should be something that causes them to feel that there's a presence of an active, an alive, and an interceding high priest. So the picture... Real simple. The priest bells on the bottom of his robe in the place, the holy place, making intercession on the part of the people. The people wanted to know if he was in there so they would listen and they would hear these bells making this beautiful sound. Guys, this is exactly what needs to go on in the church. As we're here today, guess what? We're the bells. We're the bells. We're supposed to be that which the world as it would listen, as those brothers and sisters that are beside us would listen to that which God is doing in our hearts through the Spirit empowering us through His gifts. It should sound really, really good. It should be in harmony. It should be something that's pleasant to listen to. It shouldn't sound like the rattling of pots and pans, which we'll get to in a moment. But there was something else on the bottom of the priest's robe. Something else that went along with the bells. In Exodus 39 and 25, we see the design given to Moses of what the robe's supposed to look like. And it says that they are, they are to be made bells of pure gold and put the bells, listen, between the pomegranates on the hem of the robe, all around between the pomegranates. A bell and a pom pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate, all around the hem of the robe to minister in as the Lord has commanded Moses. Now, the pomegranates were a sewn-in symbol. It wasn't an actual piece of fruit that was hanging on the bottom of the robe, but it was the pomegranate showing the fruit. And you remember where the pomegranates were first come to known to, to Israel as far as how they, they, they became so important. It was one of the first fruits that came back with Caleb and, and Jacob when they came back. It was one of the first fruits. They brought back huge grapes and pomegranates from the promised land. And the idea was is that these pomegranates represent in Bible likeness the fruit of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. And so what we're finding is, is we're finding that in order for there to be gifts of the Spirit, in order for there to be the power of the Spirit, there also has to be the fruit of the Spirit. Now what is the fruit of the Spirit? Well, we see that in Galatians 5 and 22. And it tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now stay with this picture for a minute. The high priest's robes, gold bells, in between each bell, there's fashioned a pomegranate so that they don't clash together. Without the pomegranate in between, without the space between the bells, they would just rattle. They would just make noise. And so what the Apostle Paul is doing here is he's talking to the church in Corinth and he's saying, guys, there has to be. If you're going to have the power of the Spirit manifested within the church, it has to travel in the vehicle and on the vehicle of love. There has to be a bell and a pomegranate. There has to be the power of the Holy Spirit and there has to be the love and the fruit of the Spirit that comes along with that. If not, it's going to be mishandled. See, this church in, in, in Corinth, they had no shortage of the power of the Spirit. As a matter of fact, they were somewhat overzealous for the manifestations of the Spirit of God. We'll see that next week, even more so. But the aspect of what, the Paul, what Paul has said is he's saying, guys, here's the deal. We want all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Is there anybody sitting here this morning that doesn't want every single gift and every single power that the Holy Spirit has for us? Hopefully there's nobody that says, nope, I don't want them. 
Everybody wants them. The reason that we want them is because they are that which gives us the ability to be able to do all Christ has called us to do. Everything He wants us to be is wrapped up in the power that He makes available. But the problem is, is that if I don't have love, if I don't carry the gifts in love, I'm going to misuse them. I'm going to abuse them. So with that, we see the Apostle Paul now between chapter 12 talking about gifts, and chapter 14, talking about gifts, the two bells, he's now hanging a pomegranate of love right between them. You ready? Let's do this thing. Chapter 13, verse 1. It says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but I have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. If I don't have love, all I'm doing is making noise. Oh, if you've got the King James Version, it says, if I don't have charity. Charity. Charity was a good transliteration, a translation of the word coming from, from the, the, the original text when charity meant what charity meant back then. You see, when Wycliffe translated it, it was charity meaning to give and to give and to give and to continue to give because I've been so blessed I can't help but give because I'm so happy to give. That's what charity used to mean. When we in our modern day understanding of ch the word charity say charity, it's almost a negative connotation, isn't it? Oh, we have to, yeah, we're receiving charity. We're giving charity. It's that which we don't want to, but we have to in order to be. No, see, that wasn't what charity was then. So if you've got that in the King James, roll it into the right perspective. In the translation that has ended up in our new King James, the word has been moved from the word charity to the word love because it is tied to the Greek word agape. Agape. It's an unconditional love. Oh, now the neat thing about the Greeks is that they had all types of different meanings for this word love. Whereas in our culture, it's kind of hard. You know, you can love mashed potatoes. You can love your tennis shoes. You can love your, your, your family. You can love your spouse. You can love somebody. But the fact of the matter is, is that our one word love really doesn't cover a very broad spectrum of types of love. Oh, we know that in the Greek language, there was a love that talked about just friendship about camaraderie type of, of love. We know that there was a, a physical love or a love that was, that was driven by passion and emotion. We know that there was the different types of, of love that would have allowed them to be able to take and to express specifically what they were feeling or what they were experiencing at the time. But it's interesting, this word agape didn't really come into use until Jesus Christ demonstrated it. The writers of the New Testament really didn't use this idea, this concept of what is unconditional love until it was exampled by Jesus Christ. Because here's the thing you guys need to understand. Jesus loves us for nothing. For nothing. He loves us for nothing that we do or nothing that we will ever do or anything that we will ever... He loves us unconditionally because of who He is, not because of who we are or what we do. I am really glad about that. Because the fact of the matter is, is that if I had to be lovable, I would miss from time to time. I know you guys wouldn't. I just want to confess that to you. You guys are lovable all the time, aren't you? Some of you were hard to get along with this morning just trying to make your way to church. You went into the closet and you went blind. And all of a sudden, when you were in the closet, you hear, as I do from time to time, I have nothing to wear. Okay, be careful in there. You don't trip over all those piles of nothing. Okay. The Apostle's telling us that it doesn't matter how spiritual we are. The Apostle is telling us it doesn't matter how many gifts we are able to, to express or the manifestations and the power that God has given and granted us in our life. It doesn't matter because if it's not brought in love, it's not going to serve the purpose of which God has intended it to serve. In verse 2 it says, And although I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but I have not love, it profits me 
nothing. Without love, gifts and power from the Holy Spirit are a dangerous thing. Think about this for a minute. The gift of prophecy, the gift of being able to discern and to see things clearly behind motive and behind what somebody is doing and, and, and being able to even speak prophetically into somebody's life. If I had that power without love, I could use it for self-gain. I could use it to ingratiate myself or to enslave somebody else by virtue of using this gift. How about the, the gift of faith? You know, Scripture tells us that if we have the faith that is equal to a mustard seed, right? Just the, the seed of a, of a mustard. I mean, these things, these things are like, like, like specks. If I have that much faith, I can look at a mountain and say, move, and it'll get up and jump and it will move. Can you imagine without love exercising that kind of faith, right? Think about the last argument you had with your boss. Yeah. By faith, boss, you're now a toad. <laughs> and the next word he says to you is ribbit. Wouldn't that be fun? I know it's a great thought. And we think that would be so much fun. Right? See, without love, without using the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit in such a way that it lines up with what God would have us to use, these powers on their own, separate from love, become something that are very, very unmanageable. We would abuse it. And so this is one of the reasons why in the, in the whole first section of this book, the Apostle Paul is working on this issue of unity. He's working on the church saying, you guys have got to come together in love. You've got to love each other. You've got to put other people's needs above your own. Because if you're going to experience the power that God has for you, if you're going to take and, and, and really truly identify with God His Spirit and work in His power, it has to happen in the context of love. It has to happen through this process of learning to love. Now, here's the thing. What is love? I mean, wh what is love? I mean, in our society, love has a lot of different connotations, and it's all wrapped up in one word, but the reality is, is that we really have a hard time defining it. Love means never having to say you're... Boy, that's so wrong. <laughs> Man, that is so wrong. If you really love somebody, get used to saying I'm sorry. I mean, that's just wrong, isn't it? I would expect that if you really love somebody, you've, you've actually practiced saying I'm sorry. But see, we're into very much so what is considered to be relational love. Relationship love. I, it's, the, it's the type of love that I give because I received back. I will give if I get. I will take and, and recognize that if somebody is doing something nice for me, then I'll do something nice back for them and we'll call it love. Well, it's because I love you that I do this, but the reality is, is that our example in Christ, before He went to the cross and exercised the ultimate symbol of love, what did we give Him? Anybody in here give Him anything worthwhile? <laughs> no. So His unconditional love for us has got to have a different meaning than what we apply to it. But understand, it's hard for us because we're relational beings. All right? I'll give to get. I don't mind loving you if you love me back. But boy, if I'm not going to get anything back, it becomes very, very difficult for me to look upon you in any way that's favorable because I choose that which is normal and natural over that which is of the Spirit. And that's the other connotation and the other understanding that we have to have. If we are going to love in the definition that we're about ready to go through, if we're going to love the way that God has defined love, you need to go into this with a very, very clear understanding. This can only happen with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Everybody go like this. Okay, so understand, I am incapable, absent of the power of the Holy Spirit, to exercise this kind of love, but this is the love that God promises to me and through me by the power of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Everybody go like this if you got it. If you don't, just, just go like this. I'll keep talking. Okay. So this is the connotation, this is the context that we're going to have going into this section as we define what love is, is understanding that it's an empowerment that is only granted by and through the Holy Spirit to those who have accepted and are in Jesus Christ. Now, here's the thing. Does that mean that people that are in the world that have not received Jesus Christ, that are not empowered by the Holy Spirit, 
can't love other people. Not this way. Not this way. Oh, now there's a lot of good, loving people out there. I know a lot of people that got big hearts. I know a lot of people that, that have what they have what they have deemed to be and what they truly believe in order to try to attain these things, a semblance of love. But more often than not, what we find in the world is not love. What we find is an imitation in the form of lust. What we find when we start looking at the comparisons to what the fruit of the Spirit is in our life is that we don't really find joy. We seek after happiness. And we know that happiness lasts as long as I'm getting things my way. You realize that that's the de definition of happy, right? If you find a million dollars, you're happy. If you, if you owe the IRS, you're not. And it changes just that fast. It's amazing. I mean, you can think about it. What if somebody came up to your doorstep and they said, hey, you just won a million dollars. You'd be like dancing. You'd have the, the photo shot. They would be taking pictures of you. The balloons would be going off and everything else. And then as soon as that van pulled away, a guy shows up on your door and he goes, hi, I'm here from the IRS. I'm here to help you. We need 51% of that million dollars you just earned for taxes or that you won. You would still have 49% of a million dollars, but I guarantee you, you wouldn't be happy about it. Happiness leaves that fast. There's imitations that are out there. What we're seeing here is the definition of the real deal of what love is based on what the Holy Spirit will provide to us. So let's start. You ready? Hold on. This is going to be great. Love is a warm, fuzzy feeling. No. Love suffers long. I need to find a new translation. Something's wrong. Why is it that it is not a warm, fuzzy feeling? Why is the very, very first characteristic of love in God's definition tied to suffering? <sighs> Why couldn't he have just moved into suffering from something a little less ominous? Why couldn't that be like the fourth or fifth item instead of the first one? Well, I guess it all depends on what your definition of suffering is. And then you just do that a little longer and then it becomes long suffering. Now when we talk about long suffering, we often equate it to the word patience because we know that love is patient love is kind now here's the deal though we don't know in our culture in our society we don't know as americans what patience is because we don't wait for anything i mean we don't oh now some of you oh, i'm a very patient person no you're not and neither am i that's why we always have to have the faster speed and the, 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 the quicker devices and the, the things that get it here faster. I mean, how many of you remember the sound that your modem used to make when it dialed up? You remember? You'd wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. Then finally you'd get a connection and you were able to like download, right, like a kilobyte per hour. Now, Charter's 20 times faster. 60 gigabytes per second! Needs to be faster! We're not into patience. We're into instant. But when we look at this, we often talk about how patience is, or, or long-suffering is patience on steroids, or it's patience that costs you something. And, and all that's true. The problem is, is are we really willing to suffer on behalf of others. Now, suffering on behalf of others is not putting up with the idiosyncrasies and the little quirks of your spouse or your family members. It's not just not losing it at your kids and you put yourself in a position where you pat yourself on the back and go, how is that, Lord? I'm suffering on behalf. That's not what it is. You see, we think it is. We think, well, as long as it's somebody that I'm willing to suffer for, then it's long-suffering, right? No, that's, that's not it. These are people that you're not willing to suffer for. At least not because you want to. Oh, it isn't that you shouldn't be, because Christ didn't discriminate. He was willing to suffer for any and every, everyone, whosoever will put faith in Him. Christ didn't discriminate and say, I'm only going to suffer for those. I'm only going to suffer for those. I'm only going to do what I do for just this group and not that group. 
It's not suffer for all. So our pattern of being willing to suffer has to extend beyond those that we want to suffer for. When was the last time that you found yourself maybe not getting your way on something? How did you respond? How did you react? I mean, was it somebody that was intentionally doing something to bother you or was it just that person that always gets it wrong? How did you treat them? Were you really willing to suffer along with them and suffer on their behalf for what was good for them or did you just consider long-suffering to be the write them off and to avoid them? Because see, a lot of times when there's people in our lives that we don't like, when there's people that we don't get along with, we think that we're suffering on their behalf when we just disengage and we just avoid them. You know, as a pastor from time to time, there's, there's people that, it's amazing, will absolutely avoid me. I don't understand. I'm such a nice guy. But there's people, there were people on the street yesterday that when they saw I was there, they, they kind of went. And I thought, what's that all about? There's people when I'm in the store, you can see it's so funny because they don't think you see them. But I mean, I'm always watching it. I'll see them start down an aisle and they'll see me at the end of it and they just turn around and come on. I've told you the story about how I actually found a whole family hiding in a clothes rack <laughs> at Mervyn's one time because they didn't want to see me because they were embarrassed. And it's like, what are you doing? It really happened. You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> Peter went to the Lord and said, Lord, how about I forgive my brother seven times? And Peter was expecting an accolade. Peter was expecting the Lord to go, oh, Peter, that is so magnanimous of you. That is so wonderful. You are so generous. And what did the Lord say? He said, Peter, do the math. Seventy times seven, right? And what he was telling me, to Peter, is he was saying, hey, after 490 times, you don't have to forgive anymore, right? No, it wasn't about, okay, let me pull my clicker out and we'll see. You're up to 326. You better slow down. 460 and you're out, baby. No. The idea was is that there should be no end to our willingness to be able to take and to literally suffer on behalf of others. How do I know that? Because right after Jesus said that, He went out and He showed us what it looked like by hanging on a cross. <laughs> His example was flawless, was purpose, perfect. It was without any type of hypocrisy. It says that love is kind. It's kind. Kindness has got to be the mark of the Christian's life and testimony. It doesn't matter. Listen, Christian, listen, listen, listen. It doesn't matter how right you are and how wrong they are. It doesn't matter. Anything as much as how you handle the situation. And it doesn't matter how wrong, how on the other side, even how dark they are, you can be kind. You can be kind. You can take and exercise a kind word rather than a wrathful word. And let me tell you what, this, this is one of those things that I think is so amazing. Because regardless of what is happening, regardless of what's going on around us, there is absolutely no reason at any time that we should feel the need to say something that is not kind to another person, especially those that we say we love. You see, that's why this is in the definition of love. Now, if you've ever caught yourself at any point in time having a discussion or a disagreement ever so slight with your spouse and you've gone to that harsh word or you've gone to that unkind aspect of trying to compel a behavior or a mindset or to win an argument it's not loving do you love your spouse of course i love my spouse then you, then, then you need to be kind you need to be continually looking and searching for that which is edifying and the things that you would be willing to say to the Lord you know what's really changed me in this area is when I get ready to argue with my wife and I do I mean I'm not going to tell you that I don't I argue with my wife because sometimes she's really wrong <laughs> I have to straighten her out she's also not here today uh, <laughs> she, she she's working in the, in the children's area back there then she's going to go out to to 
the, the street out on, on Dayton Valley days for the second service, and so I'll be able to get away with this twice. <laughs> But I tell you what I've started doing. I've started picturing Jesus Christ standing right next to her when I get ready to let her know how wrong she is. And I think inside my head, I can't say that. And Jesus goes, you better not. I was thinking about saying this. He says, I know what you were thinking. He says, I'll work on that issue of your heart, but right now you need to work on the issue of your tongue. You need to work on how you're presenting. And you need to work on being kind. Because if I really want to say that I love my wife, one of the ways it's going to show up is through this process of kindness. It says love does not envy. Love isn't bothered when somebody else gains. Love isn't bothered. It doesn't get bent out of shape when something good happens to somebody even if they're not a good person in our book. Well, how did they deserve that? What did they do to... I can't... They don't, they don't deserve that. How did they get the promotion? How did they get the, 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 the benefit? How come they won the raffle? I bought more tickets than they did. This aspect of envy and looking at someone that, that, that would cause us to demonstrate literally not necessarily our jealousy towards them, but our dissatisfaction towards God. You see, whenever we look at something as if we're lacking... If we look at somebody else's life and we see what they have and we think that we should have or that we want or we deserve maybe more than they do, it's not a ridiculing of them. It's a condemnation of God saying, God, you're not taking good enough care of me because I'm not satisfied with what you're giving me. Oops. And all God says is, He says, hey, I want you to be satisfied with what I give you and if you handle it okay, then I'll probably give you a little more. But you've got to be able to handle it in the first place. And you've got to be able to take and to be willing to realize that, that when God gives us a desire, if it's something that is a good motivator. Now understand, there are motivators that God will give us to achieve and to desire and to do more. When it comes to my life right now, there are many, many things that I want that are beyond what I have right now. But they're driven by and they're motivated by what I believe is what God has told me that He wants me. It's not a matter of sitting back and not doing anything and being satisfied with whatever you have. It's a matter of giving the priority to God to let Him set that in which you're seeking and that which you're going for. Because let me tell you what, He will provide great and amazing things in your life as you will take and drive and strive for them. But it has to be for His glory and not because we're dissatisfied. Love does not parade itself. Love doesn't call attention to itself. It doesn't send out a postcard telling everybody just how loving it is. It doesn't look for a photo op in order to be able to demonstrate that it's in the act of loving. But yet, also at times, we have a tendency to see this parading take on the, the effect of, of someone being needy and wanting attention. You see, if I demonstrate just how needy I am, maybe I can get other people to pay attention to me. Again, making me the center of attention, making me the center of the focus in order to be able to take and to draw the attention to myself. Now realize, again, all of these attributes, these things that are, are giving us the description and the definition of love are not possible in our flesh, but only through the Spirit. Next one, love is not puffed up it's not puffed up not only does it not parade itself love doesn't think about being loving beforehand now be honest be honest you've thought about doing something for someone and you know it's a nice gesture you know it's a good thing and you go through the whole process of just how thankful they should be when they receive it haven't you <laughs> come on be honest you have it's like, oh, this is going to be so good. This is good. They are just, they, they need to appreciate this. Oh, my goodness, this is such a big sacrifice on my part. This is a wonderful thing that I'm doing. And, and, and because of this, boy, they just need. It says that if we really love someone, that we're not going to try to predetermine the outcome. We're not going to keep track of how loving we've been in order to be able to hold it up. I've been, I've done everything and you've done nothing. It's not loving i got to tell you, I am very, very proud of the way that I've grown into my humility. 
Oh, seriously, no. The Lord has worked on me for many, many years, making me very, very humble. And my humility is a shining example for all of you to see. And you guys should be proud of my humility as I am. Yeah, see, it's not, some, it's not something that can draw attention to itself and not seem ridiculous. But sometimes that's what we do in our hearts and in our heads. Maybe not outwardly. But we do the same thing when it comes to drawing attention to our efforts in relationship to calling it love. Love does not behave rudely. Rudely. Again, I told you I see Jesus standing next to my wife when I'm trying to correct her behavior. Um, but I often wonder what Jesus is thinking when he just is looking in on and constantly sees our interactions with other people. Whether it just be our daily routines going through, a, going through life or or if it's really something that's just happening in our, in our heads. And I'll tell you, there's times when I'm so glad that what's going on in here is not projected in some sort of billboard or banner on my forehead. Oh, man. I mean, I am so glad that my thought life can be contained within myself, but I have to continually be aware of the fact that it's not contained out of the sight of God, and especially out of the sight of Christ. I often have to start exercising love through restraint it's the thumper rule you remember the thumper rule if you can't say anything nice don't say anything at all <laughs> oh man what a what a difficult situation to find ourselves in because there's stuff that i know i could say that is is not real nice but it's good and it fits the situation. You know what I'm talking about? You've got that zinger. You've got that thing, man. And you know, oh, man, this is going to be like, whew, man, this is going to be on target bullseye. But is it rude? A lot of times we don't realize the effect of our behavior and how far it reaches outside of ourselves. Let me tell you what, guys. Someone is always watching. Someone always sees that which you do, good or bad. If you're in the house, let me tell you what, it's the kids. Or it's your spouse. If you're out in public, my wife and I, we, can't, we really can't go anywhere. I mean, we can't. It's not because we're celebrities. It's just there's a lot of people that know us. Our faces are recognizable. We've been out there for a while, been doing ministry in what is a very small community of northern Nevada for a very long time. We can't go to Walmart, we can't go to Costco, we can't go to Goodwill, we can't go anywhere without running into somebody that we know, right? Now, there's times that that's wonderful. I told you the other day about how we had church in the back of Goodwill a few times. It's, it's wonderful, back by the book section back there. Everybody seems to gather, we just have a great time. But my wife is always cognizant, more so than I am, because we'll be having one of those interesting discussions, walking down the aisle at Walmart, and she'll say, not now. Why? Well, yeah, I want to talk about it. Not now. And I'll say, what do you mean not now? She says, you don't know who's around. I don't. And I, you know what the first thing I say is? I don't care. <laughs> Anybody else? And then you come around the corner and you care. I've had it be the very person I was talking about. <laughs> and then my wife looks at me and goes, Somebody always knows. Now, you may not believe this or not, but there is people that are watching everything, especially that Christians do, because we're supposed to be example in Christ. I did something a few years ago, and I did it because I thought it was the right thing to do, and I'm really very, very comfortable with it. I put on the back of my car and on the front of my car a license plate that says, Yes, Lord. It's a constant reminder every time I get into the car that my answer to the Lord is yes. I like that. Then on the back of my car, I got some window decals. I got a Calvary Chapel, Dayton Valley deco, decal right in the back of the window, and I got it all in men's ring. And it's, and it's a constant reminder every time I, I get into my car that I am representing Christ how I drive. You with me? All right. Okay. Because, yeah, yeah, because I tell you what, it really modifies and changes your behavior if you know that it's there. Or at least it should. I'm going to preface this by saying we don't know who you are. We really don't. We got a phone call at the church the other day from a lady that was very, very upset and distraught because someone had impressed upon her by virtue of a hand gesture, his emotional distraught 
and, and discontent over the way that she was driving. And he used the evangelist finger. <laughs> the long-reaching one on your hand. In order to demonstrate how he was not happy with her. As he passed by, she noticed the Calvary Chapel Dayton Valley sticker on the back of his car. And so she called the church. She called. And when she called, the first thing that we did is apologize profusely and then told her that it must be that the car had to be stolen because none of our people <laughs> would do that. She was concerned because at the time that it happened, her kids were in the car with her. It was an evangelistic moment, all right. There was a far-reaching message that went out, but it wasn't the message that we wanted it to be. Oh, now, I'm not, like I said, I don't know who you are because she didn't give a really good description, and hopefully we were able to take and to, to encourage her and let her know that, you know, hey, that's, it's a good thing that they're, that they're here because obviously God's not done with any of us yet and not done with them too. And so I'm not looking to, I mean, I'm looking to see who's ducking under the chair right now. Just be careful. We're representing Jesus Christ in everything that we do. And if somebody isn't watching you, He is. He is. Love doesn't seek its own. And I'm going to add the word way. Love doesn't seek its own way. It's always looking for what is best for the other person, what is, what is in their clear interest, not just in my interest. I'm not looking to gain with every relationship, with everyone that, that, that I would identify as being loving with. As a matter of fact, my concern should be more for them than it is for myself, says the Lord. It says that love is not provoked. I can't force you to love me. If you love me, you will. If you really want to show me that you love me, then you'll do this. Guys, love is not to be something that is put out in a way that it provokes, that it becomes something that we are forced to or believe that in order to be able to demonstrate that we have to meet somebody else's attempt to try to seek their own way. Again, they're juxtaposed to each other. Love thinks no evil. Oh man, this is a hard one. <sighs> It thinks no evil. This is one that I really believe that we have to practice. I believe we have to practice all of them in, our, in, in ourselves and rely on the Spirit for the power to do it. We have to be willing to do any of these for any of them to take place. The Spirit isn't just going to come and give us a Holy Spirit download that instantly makes us kind and, and, and makes us considerate and makes us, makes us not seek our own interests. But we have to be willing to practice these. And I think that very often the first thing that I've got to do is I've got to grab that thought and I've got to hold it captive as Scripture tells me to and I've got to keep it from growing and keep it from getting any larger. There's people out there that it's real easy to think evil of, isn't it? Hmm. Love doesn't rejoice in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. This idea of rejoicing in iniquity is that it doesn't rejoice when that person that we were thinking evil of gets what they've got coming to them. And that's hard too because there's people that, let me tell you what, there's people that deserve what comes their way. I knew it wasn't going to last. They'd just been faking this the whole time. So look at them now. They're crashing and burning. <laughs> their families are wrecked. Their lives are wrecked. They lost their job. Good. They did. That's not loving. It's not what Christ does to us. It's not the example that He's given us. It's not that which He would have us to do. And it says that we are not supposed to rejoice in iniquity. Can we see the evidence of a ungodly life being corrected by consequence and look upon it and have compassion on a person yes it doesn't mean that we have to celebrate their demise and nor should we love bears all things believes all things hopes all things i'd like to end it there but it goes on and says endures all things this is not a blind aspect of being naive this isn't sticking your head into the sand and, and acting like things aren't going around you. What it means is it means that because I have hope in Christ and because Christ 
took me out of the miry clay because Christ snatched me out of the, the grips of hell and death that everyone else has the same hope and the same ability that I was given granted of. Everybody has. And so I can hope the best for them. It doesn't mean that I agree with them, but it means that when I look at the cross of Calvary, I realize that Jesus Christ has paid the cost for my sin. That it's been paid. And not only that, He paid the cost for their sin just as he did mine. And their failure to receive it puts them into a much less place than I as far as not being better than, but being better off than they are. So by being better off, does it mean that I stand in a position of superiority and look back and laugh? No, it means that I'm doing everything I can to try to bring them into the same grace that I received. Love never fails. But whether there be prophecies, they will fail. Whether there's tongues, they'll cease. Whether there's knowledge, it'll vanquish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. Or when that which is perfect. Guys, when Jesus Christ returns, the only thing that is going to be important not going to be how many times we spoke a word of knowledge, how many times we spoke in tongues, not how many times we, we manifested some power of the Holy Spirit and through, through the gifts that He's given us. The only thing that's going to matter is love. I believe that what Jesus is going to come up, He's not going to come up and ask us how much we gave. He's not going to come up and ask, him, ask us how much work we did. He's not going to come up and ask us all of the things. I don't think He's going to come to me and say, Gary, how many sermons did you preach? How many times did you, did you go out and stand on Pike Street and hand off, oh man, we're going to count those. I think he's just going to say is, how many people did you love? Did you love? Oh, not because you were able to, but because you allowed me in you and my, peer, my spirit to flow through you to love in my name. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, we see in the mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known, and now abide in faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Guys, faith looks back. Faith looks back and tells me that I can embrace the forgiveness that Jesus Christ has given me and I no longer have to be haunted by the things that have happened in my past. Hope looks forward. Hope looks forward to the time that I'll be reunited with Jesus face to face and everything that, that I've lived through and worked for, good, bad, and, 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 and ugly, will be made new and fresh in Jesus Christ. But love, love, the reason that love is the greatest is because love is here and now. It's right here. It's right now. The person who lacks faith is not going to be able to love because they're too concerned with the baggage they have from the past. The person who has no hope is too worried about what's going to happen tomorrow to be able to be content with what they have today and to be able to share. But if we have love for one another, we're going to be able to make a difference in the here and now. In chapter 12, right at the end, the Apostle Paul left us with these words, and now he's demonstrated what it is. He says, and yet I show you a more excellent way. The excellent way? What is it, guys, everybody? It's love. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. And Lord, may it be that we would take and choose to love. Oh, Lord, we have to make the choice first. We know that we don't have the power within ourselves to be able to do it as you exampled it. But, Lord, we also know that through the power of your Holy Spirit, as we would yield, as we would put ourselves into your care and under your authority and under your power, that, Lord, we will have the ability to grow in loving others. And what a sweet release we receive. Oh, Lord, when we love others, Lord, it's because we're loving you. Jesus, you told us that when we reach out and we do so in your name, that it pleases you. So, Lord, may it be.
Lord, if there's any here today that have yet to come to a place of salvation, I, I want you to know that today is the day of salvation. You need to just simply make your way forward. You need to come to the left or right to the folks that are standing here wanting to pray with you, wanting to agree with you that you need to walk into and step into the true love that was demonstrated to you in order for you to be able to walk in the love that God has designed for each and every one of us. If you just need prayer, maybe you're struggling. Maybe you've not been loving. Oh, that should be only about all of us. That we really haven't been acting upon that which God has displayed. We've been relying on feelings and emotion and what we've been calling love is anything but. If that's you, you come, you receive prayer today too. Don't, don't leave this place without reconciling things to the Lord in your heart and in your mind and then asking Him, Holy Spirit, give me the power. Give me your fresh anointing to love others as Christ has loved me. Oh Lord, it's in your name we pray. We thank you for your love bestowed upon us. Amen.